So in this session, we're going to be looking at some, some of the impulse and self-control theories of addictive behaviour, which specifically consider some of the issues around impulse control uh, and the role that that plays in the development of problems with addiction. Uh, and also this notion of self-control, um, which is in a broad sense, a broad psychological sense, the extent to which we are able to and some of the constraints that are placed on our ability to exert willful self-control over our behaviour. Um, the session is broadly broken down into three main sections, looking at one uh, specific theory, very important theory in the addictions field known as incentive sensitization theory. Uh, we'll then move on to take a look at uh, some of the uh, cognitive models of drug craving and urges, because craving itself is something that is a, a very well understood concept um, in a general sense in that if you ask people even just uh, you know non-experts what they think craving is most people can explain it but actually um, at a technical level um, some of the explanations that we have for what craving is are not necessarily that clear and the role that craving plays um, in the development maintenance um, and, and things like relapses in the context of addiction isn't necessarily always that clear and so there are two particular models or theorists whose work we'll, we'll look at in this regard uh, which is the Tiffany and, and Franken uh, and then we'll move on in the third part of the session uh, to look at some of the issues around mental control in addictive behaviours and specifically the way in which people deal with negative thoughts um, in relation to addictive behaviour. Um, and, and in that area we'll look at some of the unanswered questions and things that we also don't at the moment uh, know uh, a great deal about. So insensitive sensitization theory is a very important theory and a very well-known theory in the addictions field. Um, and it's important for a very particular reason, um, uh, which I'll come on to um, just shortly. But broadly speaking, the important contribution, one of the important contributions of Robinson and Berridge's insensitive sensitization theory is that it really builds upon the learning theory approach. This idea that, that, that addiction is a learned um, phenomenon, that it's something that, that develops as a result of experience and that it's linked to the, the activity in the reward pathways is something that Robinson and Berridge really built upon and provided an explanation in a neurobiological sense for some of that sort of fundamental um, learning process, particularly operant conditioning, uh, in the sense that we know that the behaviour is uh, reinforced and rewarded. Um, now, as we already understand from our, our, our session on uh, learning theories of addiction, um, we know that people are that one of the ways in which we learn is through um, the association with reward and behaviour. So that's operant conditioning. You do a particular behaviour, you engage in a certain action, and that leads to a reward. And we also know that that leads to uh, the release of dopamine in the dopaminergic reward pathways. And that's a completely ordinary process. That's a normal way in which we learn. We learn to associate rewards with certain actions, and that increases the likelihood that we will do those things again. Makes perfect sense. Why would you not? The difficulty with drugs uh, to which people become dependent upon um, is that they um, that, that they hyper make this system hyper responsive. So the attribution of what Robinson and Berry's described as incentive salience is a really important aspect. So the downstream impact of the release of dopamine is that the cues that are associated with the behaviour that you engaged in um, <clears throat> trigger this wanting or this compulsive urge to have to engage in that behaviour again. And following chronic drug use, this hyper responsiveness of that system means that you're much more likely and it, it, it gains greater power over your behaviour uh, as a result of long-term exposure to these particular drugs. And this dysfunction can also persist well into abstinence. It's important to say this isn't something that is a, an, effect, an acute effect of the drugs. It's something that builds up and grows over time. That wanting, that compulsion becomes stronger with time. And so the incentive salience, that concept of incentive salience, is really a way of saying that the cues in our environment, the things around us that are associated with this rewarding behaviour, could be drugs or alcohol or even gambling, um, that they... they but we become hyper vigilant to those things. They are very, very attention grabbing to us, and that's the way that our um, the reward pathways effectively are guiding our behaviour. You learn that certain things, certain situations, certain behaviours are going to lead to a reward, and so you're then vigilant to those things. And again, that's a normal thing. That's a normal behaviour. If you know, um, you know, you're sort of walking through a crowd of people and you spot a person whose company you really enjoy, you'll notice that person out of a crowd of strangers, even if you weren't expecting to see them, because your visual system is attuned to identify it, attributes incentive salience to the cue of that person's face. Um, and so that's the same thing that's happening all the time. We're not just a passive recipient of all the information that we process in the world, the sounds and the smells and the, uh, the, the visual stimuli. 
we are constantly trying to filter out the things that mean something and don't mean something to us. And really what Robinson and Berridge were getting at when they spoke about incentive salience and this sense of hyper-responsiveness is that, particularly in the context of drug dependence, drugs and drug-related cues will attract very, a very strong sense of incentive salience. They will be extremely attention-grabbing uh, once drug dependence has taken hold. Really important concept and distinction that, that's credited to Robinson and Berridge's theory of incentive sensitization was this key distinction they make between drug liking and drug wanting. Now, in, in, in ordinary terminology, these two things may not sound necessarily you know, may not sound too distinct, but the technical distinction that they make between drug liking and drug wanting is that drug liking represents the conscious aspect, the conscious hedonically focused desires that you may have, that if you're using heroin or drinking alcohol or smoking a cigarette, there may be certain pleasures that you derive from that, at least early on um, in your use of the substances. Um, and the drug liking is the, is the part of you that says, well, I'm doing this because I like the way it makes me feel. And, and that's the reason that you may experiment with the drug. That's the reason that you may persist with use over a period of time, even if there might be some concern about longer term risks. This drug liking is essentially just the part of you that says, but I really like feeling as euphoric as heroin makes me feel. And that's the reason that I take it. And doing that isn't drug dependence. You know, people, um, even though it's, uh, it's, it's uncommon and heroin is a drug that is very easily to develop tolerance and then uh, withdrawal symptoms and ultimately dependence too, there are people who use drugs like heroin on a recreational basis without becoming heavily dependent. As I say, it's a, a very risky area because of the, uh, the, the, the extent to which it's quite easy to become uh, dependent on heroin, but people can do that and they can, they can drug like, as it were. But drug wanting is what Robinson and Berry's described as what happens when this compulsion takes hold. And that compulsion takes hold because of what's happening in the reward pathways, that you are being constantly reinforced and hyper reinforced in a sense uh, by the effects of this drug on the reward pathways, which is acting on the reward pathways in a way that ordinary rewards in your environment wouldn't. So the ordinary rewards that we experience in life, whether that's pleasure that we gain from being in the company of friends or doing particular hobbies or things that, that give us pleasure, um, the, 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 the impact of drugs of dependence on the reward pathways is much stronger and much more persistent. And so as a result of that, what Warren Robinson Berridge were trying to disaggregate is why we have this what seems to be a paradox and sometimes referred to as a loss of control in addiction, that people can get to a point in their use of a drug or alcohol or gambling where they actually say they no longer like it and yet nonetheless find it very, very difficult to stop. And that paradox is, is part of what Robinson and Berridge were trying to unpick. They were sort of trying to separate these two things out. Why is it that people can say, I don't want to do this behavior, I no longer like being, uh, you know, drinking alcohol or using heroin or whatever it may be, it's taking control of my life, I really don't enjoy it anymore, I wish I could stop. And yet on the other hand, be possessed of this compulsion to nonetheless have to keep doing it. And what Robinson and Berridge were, were, were doing by separating out these two concepts of drug liking and drug wanting were saying that in effect the development of uh, drug dependence is, is really ex typified by the development of drug wanting that in the absence of drug wanting you're not dependent but once drug wanting takes hold once you have this compulsive urge to have to use that's the thing that distinguishes you from somebody who's simply say, a recreational user uh, of that drug. Uh, and that once that drug wanting takes hold, once you have this strong association between that behaviour and the expectation of reward, it actually no longer matters whether or not you subjectively like it, because your brain has been um, uh, trained, in effect, to expect that this is nonetheless a really rewarding behaviour. And so this is a really important distinction that was made, and that prior to Robinson and Berridge's work, was an area that we struggled with in the addictions field, um, and we didn't have the language for making that differentiation as clearly as they did. Two related processes that underlie these concepts of drug liking and drug wanting are habituation and sensitization. So habituation is essentially the thing that happens to the hedonic value of the drug. So we become habituated to the effect of what the drug does. People use phrases like chasing the dragon and so on uh, in relation to heroin use. That you use a particular drug over and over and over again and you develop tolerance to it, you become habituated to its effect. The, the, the once kind of euphoric high that you may have felt from using that drug um, several years down the line is no longer there, that you're no, you're no longer uh, have, see as much value. But equally also, even if there is some um, positive value, say from, from using things like alcohol, um, that you can become habituated to that as well. It can just sort of matter less to you. 
But what's also happening is as a result of what happens with the effects of these drugs on the reward pathways is you become sensitized to the effects of drugs. And that makes those drugs and, and cues associated with those drugs much more salient to you, that you become sensitized to them. Um, so that again is, is two of the things that underpin this, this transition from drug liking to drug liking and wanting to in many cases just drug wanting in the absence of drug liking. So what this then leads to uh, under their, their theory is why we have this imbalance between the level of pleasure that a drug provides versus the degree to which it's sought. And actually nicotine's a really good example of this. Now it's not the case that people who smoke cigarettes get absolutely no pleasure from doing it. There are many people who, contrary to, to what may be uh, the belief of many, um, will actually say they enjoy smoking. Um, but even those people that say they enjoy smoking are highly unlikely to describe smoking a cigarette as the most enjoyable, pleasurable thing that they've ever experienced in their life. You know, the effect of, of nicotine and the effect of, of smoking a cigarette just isn't, you know, in, in any you know, reasonable interpretation, doesn't really provide that degree of, of pleasurable response. And yet nicotine is a highly addictive substance and part of our understanding of that is because of the impact that nicotine has on the reward pathways. That effectively that drug wanting, that, that sense of having to do it becomes really, really strongly entrenched. Um, despite the fact that they're, they're, the, the, the extent to which a person is pursuing their, their habit of, say, using, uh, using tobacco seems to, to, to in no way align with the level of pleasure that they may be experiencing, even when they may be aware of the significant risks associated with uh, using tobacco. And this explains why drug use, as I've said, can continue even after the liking of the drug. And in many cases, in the case of drugs like heroin, uh, is, a, is a particularly good example of that, where actually the high and the euphoria after many years of use just almost exists no more. The only thing that the drug does is really gets you back on the level. It, it eliminates the withdrawals. It moves from positive reinforcement to pretty much only negative reinforcement. Um, what also goes along with this is the impact of particular drugs. Certain types of drugs have different effects on the brain, but it can lead to cognitive deficits in our ability to inhibit responses or to think about future consequences. And psychostimulant drugs, drugs like methamphetamine, have a particular effect in that regard. They, they have a particular damaging effect on the parts of the brain associated with behavioural control. So all taken together, with the sensitization of the reward pathways kind of telling you that you know that this is something that you need to do this compulsive urge to do it that you may not even be able to put into words but this sense of having to of needing to do something um, disaggregated from the the liking that you may have experienced perhaps earlier on in your uh, your use of a drug um, combined with the fact that you're then less able to to, to suppress those compulsive urges um, explains the strength with which addictions can take hold There are some issues with the incentive sensitization theory. There have been criticisms of it over the years. Some of the criticism get really deep into the sort of neurobiological um, processes involved, question marks about the, the centrality and importance of dopamine alone, and there are, there is, there's other more recent work in that area. Um, part of the problem, but we're going to come on to this shortly, is how this concept of craving and urge is, is characterised and thought about because we don't actually understand craving and urges as well as we perhaps ought to. Um, we do know that they seem to be important, but we don't quite know where they come from and how they operate. And I'm going to say something on that in just a moment. Um, and there is also some uh, sort of criticism that's been levelled at the theory, which is it's based very heavily, uh, and certainly a lot of the early work was based very heavily on animal research, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily say is the biggest problem in the world. People doing animal research are very often aware of the limitations of how far they can generalise animal research to uh, human models. Um, but there is indirect evidence, even if there isn't direct neurobiological evidence of processes of incentive sensitization occurring in human brains, <clears throat> there is evidence showing that people do have what we call, and again we'll come on to this just shortly, attentional biases for drug and alcohol related cues, i.e. If we're assuming that this, this idea of incentive salience occurs, uh, or if this process of incentive salience occurs within the brain, which attaches um, a strong sense of the expectation of reward to drug and alcohol related cues, then you would expect that in a visual sense, people would be attending towards those cues. And that's exactly what uh, we see from a lot of the work in the area of attentional bias. And I'll, I'll give some more examples of that uh, shortly. So that brings us on to the cognitive theories of drug urges. Um, and as I've said, the, the, the concept of drug urge or compulsion or craving is something that intuitively people kind of understand. Most people know what we mean by it, but actually 
The role and the process that it plays in the context of the maintenance or development of addictive behaviours isn't always as clear. Stephen Tiffany's 1990 work, although it's now um, quite old, has actually been very influential in our thinking about what craving is. Now, Tiffany argued that dependence is a form of automatic behaviour, that effectively it's the development of a habitual pattern of behaviour that becomes automated over time. Like many behaviours, and, and uh, Tiffany uses, uh, and sometimes has been criticised for this, using the example of learning to ride a bike, that it's something you have to put effort in to begin with, but over time it becomes automated. Um, and the argument is that the repeated use of drugs leads to the automatization of drug urges, that this becomes a sort of a perpetual cycle and that increases the frequency of use. So the urges are created by your past history of use and the urges themselves promote prospective use in the future. Now there's a particularly interesting insight that came from Tiffany's model, which is that, that craving in and of itself is actually more complicated than we think it is. Tiffany's argument was that there are two components to craving. There's an automatic and a controlled component. What he was arguing essentially was that the controlled component of craving is actually only the tip of the iceberg and that craving in and of itself happens subconsciously or non-consciously and automatically much more frequently. And so to take a simple example, if you have um, a, uh, even if you're just a heavy drinker, so not necessarily even alcohol dependent, um, uh, the severe end of the scale of, of alcohol use, if you're just a very heavy drinker and you're at home one evening and you have the thought that you want to have a drink, if you have alcohol in the house, you know, a bottle of wine or beer in the fridge or spirits, whatever your potential uh, preference would be, then what Tiffany would argue is that actually that craving in the sense of there being um, a stimulus, which is maybe even just the thought of having a drink or a contextual cue that maybe a particular programme comes on and you always drink alcohol when it's on, you know, it's uh, you know, maybe something you do on a Friday night or whatever it may be, that that just leads to the activation of the goal to use. And if you're able to immediately satiate that goal, literally by going to the fridge and getting out a can of beer and opening it and drinking it, then Tiffany's argument is that actually there's no need for your more limited controlled processes in the brain to be activated and switched on. There's no problem to solve. You simply get up out of your chair, go and get the drink and drink it. And so you won't have this strong sense of a craving, this compulsive urge to have to use because the automatic goal to have a drink is able to immediately be uh, realised. However, on the other hand, if in that exact same situation you had that thought that you were going to get a drink or there was an automatic goal activated to drink alcohol, but then there's nothing in the fridge and there's nothing in the cupboard, then what, what may happen in, in Tiffany's model is that you then need to initiate more controlled conscious processes. You need to find a way of resolving the problem. Do you go out, do you order a takeaway and ask for some beers to be sent round? You know, is there, how are you going to resolve this problem? You've got this, this automatic goal that's been activated, but because you're unable in that moment to satiate that desire, then what happens is that your higher cognitive processes are activated because now you need to find a way, you need to find a solution to the problem. And that is what Tiffany would describe as being the, what in, in, in the terms of intensive sensitization theory, what you can consider to be the wanting, that compulsion to need to do, that's being triggered by the automatic goal that has been activated. And simply then craving, when it's non-automatic, when craving is experienced subjectively, the reason for that is that you're unable to immediately satiate your desire. So Tiffany then sees subjective craving as being the result of the interruption of an automatic drug seeking process. So if we're able to immediately satiate our goal, there is no need for us to become subjectively involved, if you like. We can simply do the behavior. We can behave, as it were, mindlessly. And this interruption can happen either due to individual or environmental influences. So having no alcohol available in the situation I've just described um, could induce craving because you're in a situation where there's an automatic goal that's been activated to have a drink, but you can't. And you need to think about getting to an off license if your you know, sort of partner or someone you live with is on their way home, asking them to pop in uh, to pick some drink up and bring it in with them. Whatever it may be, you need to be actively engaged. But it could also be that this craving is, is triggered by a conscious attempt to stop yourself from drinking, that the desire could be triggered because you, put, you try to in, you know, in, engage um, a degree of control, um, such as through the process of recovery. This particular model is supported by studies on attentional bias, which is a phenomenon that I've already mentioned, and quite you know, again, quite simply, the notion of attentional bias is simply that 
different cues and stimuli in our environment mean different things to us. They have a different degree of what Miles Cox would call motivational salience. So motivational salience is essentially just the extent to which of all the things that you could observe uh, you know, at any point during your day, some of them mean something uh, more to you than others. You know, Things that you like to eat, people you like to spend time with, um, such, you know, sort of whatever it may be, your favourite colour, seeing some clothes that somebody wears that you really like. There are just things that you see in the world around you that mean more to you. They're more attention grabbing and this is what we describe as an attentional bias it's simply that there are certain things that you will pay more attention to you'll find it harder to disengage from them and you'll also automatically orient your attention towards them this has also been shown um, to exist in problem drinkers but also amongst drinkers in general there's a fairly linear relationship between the amount of alcohol that you drink just the sheer volume and the strength of your attentional bias measured in various ways using reaction time tasks and so on so if you're a very heavy drinker you're more likely to be distracted by alcohol related cues seeing a pub seeing a poster for alcohol um, you know, particularly if it's a brand that you like um, and if you're a problem drinker or a dependent drinker, then you'll be even more distracted by that because the, the, you know, those cues have even more motivational salience for you. And so that's consistent with what we were just describing in terms of uh, Tiffany's work. And these studies also show that um, that this attentional bias can also overwhelm. It can also inter interfere with your ability to engage in unrelated tasks. It can become very distracting because you're constantly attuned to these sorts of cues in your environment. And again, cross-reference back to the work of intensive sensitization theory, Rob Robinson and Berridge's work, this idea that the incentive salience has been attributed. So the question as to where attentional bias comes from, how is it that we um, come to know which cues to identify, because we're not doing it on a conscious level, we're not consciously looking at every individual thing in a particular visual scene and kind of consciously going, well, that's something I don't like, that's something I do like. It's just instantaneous. You just look at a particular scene and you will be instantly drawn towards the thing that means mean more to you. When I say instantly, what I mean is automatically. These are automatic cognitive processes that occur very rapidly and pre-consciously. Um, and the reason for that is in part for those cues that have some um, incentive salience attached to them in Robinson and Berridge's terms, it's because the, 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 the dopaminergic reward pathways have attributed that expectation of reward to those particular cues so that in future you very rapidly orient your attention towards them. And again, I want to reinforce this point. I keep on saying this, but these are not pathological processes. These are processes that if you think about them outside of the context of addictive behavior are actually really, really useful. They're a really useful way of us learning about our environment, picking up on the things that are more likely to produce rewards or positive outcomes for us and noticing them more you know so that you don't miss situations or environments or cues which signal to you that there could be some benefit <coughs> and it's also been shown that these attentional biases can be positively related to craving so try sort of starting to close this loop back round that we have these attentional biases and that these attentional biases will trigger um, thoughts about engaging in the behavior. So you, you know, the situation I described being at home on a Friday night, if simply being in that environment and in that situation is a situation in which you would usually drink, then the cues in that environment are going to trigger. So due to these attentional biases will trigger craving. Uh, and in this particular Michael Sayet's work, uh, back from, again from back in the 90s, shows that attentional bias for smoking related words, the strength of your attentional bias is associated with things like this, the, the severity of subjective craving and also it seems to change as a function of the last time you had a cigarette so the longer you go without having a cigarette the stronger your attentional bias becomes so it suggests that attentional biases are serving this kind of searching role this this uh, appetitive role in in goal directed behavior which in that case would be to find and smoke a cigarette and I like this particular comment because it sort of presaged really what Tiffany was saying from a, a book by Ludwig in 88, um, talking about the automaticity of problem drinking. Ludwig said that others essentially think instinctively, short-circuiting both imagery and cognitions, and are inclined to act without knowing why. When alcohol becomes readily available, they drink before they think. Now that's a really interesting sort of analogy, this idea of, you know, that you just do the behaviour without thinking about it. But the really interesting thing about this, of course, is that that is not unusual or specific to people with problems of addictive behaviour. That's for most of us most of the time. Most of our actions and behaviours that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, 
don't involve really sort of high, you know, high level cognitive processes. We just sort of do things almost as it were on autopilot because that's how human behavior develops. That's how the human mind works. I want to say something about the very long named uh, work of uh, Franken's neuropsychopharmacological model because I think this, this neatly then um, brings together a lot of the things that we've just been talking about. And so Franken was attempting to integrate evidence from areas of attentional bias research into um, a more holistic model to understand things like craving, but also the process of relapse. And this is essentially a cognitive model. It's described it here as a neuropsychopharmacological model because the paper, and it's worth a read, goes into quite a bit of detail about the neuropsychopharmacological underpinnings of all of these processes. But it's fundamentally a cognitive model trying to explain how all of these different cognitive processes link together. So the model here, um, it's, as you can see, it's a kind of a circular model, but starting from the top there, this idea is that, that the perception of drug-related stimuli can lead to an increase in dopaminergic activity because of the past use and expectation of reward. That increased dopaminergic activity, again, thinking back to incentive sensitization theory, is the thing that creates attentional bias because of the attribution of incentive salience. You've attributed two certain cues, a bottle of beer, a glass of wine, the expectation of positive reward. So your attentional system is attuned, is looking out for those cues more than other things. It's prioritizing making you pay attention to them more than it's prioritizing you pay atten paying attention to other things. That leads to attentional bias, and that attentional bias can lead to craving. Craving itself is essentially increasing the thoughts that you may have, and in Tiffany's model, that could be either automatic or controlled forms of craving, and that can use to, in, in this particular model, can lead to drug use and relapse. But the other interesting thing here is to think about what this attentional bias does. So moving to the left-hand side of this, uh, this image, where there are those three boxes in the dotted lines. The consequence of having an attentional bias triggered or having this attentional bias for certain cues isn't only that it can increase craving and that craving can also have an impact on increasing attentional bias. Thinking again about the evidence from Sayet's work that I just mentioned, that, 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 that when we are, uh, when the person goes for a longer period without smoking, their attentional bias will increase. The attentional bias increases craving, the craving increases attentional bias until you finally have a cigarette. But there are other consequences of attentional bias. What attentional biases do, so working from the top there, is the first thing is it enhances the signal, uh, enhance, leads to enhanced signaling of drug cues. So what this means is that you are paying attention more to the cue, which ironically then leads to this circular increase in the likelihood of you attending to them again, because you're exposing yourself to that cue more. The other thing that it can do is increase drug-related cognitions. We know that memory is associative. We know that if we think about certain things, you know, simple basic principles of free association, by thinking about one thing, it makes you think about other related things. So having an attentional bias that is triggered, that's making you attend to drug or alcohol, whatever related cues, will increase your thoughts about other similar related things, which is again, increasing almost your preoccupation, the extent to which you are starting to become more almost obsessive about the particular uh, object of your attentional bias. But the other really important thing to bear in mind about an attentional bias is that it is using the attentional system. That by having this attentional bias activated and, and seeking out and paying attention to those cues, it prevents you from paying attention to other things. It can deplete your attentional resources. And by depleting your attentional resources, if you are, for example, trying to um, engage in a period of uh, abstinence or, or you're currently in recovery, that attentional bias is going to deplete your attentional resources, making you focus on these, uh, the, these cues um, uh, and stimuli related to drug use. And by doing that, it can weaken your resolve, it can weaken your ability to maintain this effortful act of recovery. And so that in itself could lead to further episodes of drug use or relapse. And so as you can see there, it's sort of a complex model on the face of it, but actually it's really trying to bring together from the areas of incentive sensitization, Tiffany's work, attentional bias research, bring together into a more integrated model, an understanding of how all of these things can interact to perpetuate a behavior that can be problematic. So the last topic that I want to cover is really this uh, idea of mental control. So I've spoken about self-control uh, and impulses and so on, and where these things may come from. But there's also a strong element, particularly in addictive behaviours, but in life in general, of us trying to exert control over our own mental world. Um, 
And there are two particular areas of work I want to focus on. The first is thought suppression. So in the context of um, intrusive negative thoughts, um, thought suppression is a form of, of avoidant coping. So if you are dealing with an intrusive negative thought, so in an addictions context, it could be you know, sort of worrying about relapsing. It could be that you're trying to deal with, you know, to stop smoking, to stop drinking, stop using heroin, whatever it may be. You may be in treatment. You may be doing all you can to try and change your behavior. An intrusive thought that you could have in that context may be, what if I slip? What if I have a relapse or a relapse? What if I'm not able to do this? We can have these thoughts all the time. Of course, they can be addiction relevant, but we can all have intrusive and we all do have intrusive negative thoughts at various points in our lives. Thought suppression is an avoidant coping strategy. And avoidant coping strategies, I won't bury the lead here, avoidant coping strategies are not very good. They're not an effective way of dealing with intrusive negative thoughts because all they do is just delay them, push them to somewhere else. They don't resolve them. They don't deal with the root of why it is that this thought is intrusive and negative in the first place. But this specific form of avoidant coping, thought suppression, is very importantly to be understood as a conscious attempt to not think about something. So it's not an unconscious thing, it's not something you do without awareness of doing it. If you thought suppress, you know that you're doing it. You could tell me that you've just done it. And the consequence, the negative consequences of thought suppression are twofold. It can lead to cognitive rebound. So cognitive rebound simply means that by trying to make yourself not think about something, it actually increases the frequency that you end up thinking about it. It increases the frequency of this particular negative thought spontaneously popping back into consciousness again in future. But it can also lead to behavioral rebound, which is that if you're trying not to think about an intrusive negative thought that relates to a behavior or action, that by increasing the amount of time that you think about it, it actually increases the probability that you'll do the behaviour. And of course, if you think about it, that sort of makes sense. You know, the more that you keep being preoccupied and thinking about something, the more chance there is really that at some point you'll enact the behaviour. You're unlikely to engage in behaviours and things that you're simply not thinking about, that you're completely expunged from mind um, completely. Uh, the best example I can give of this from sort of common experience would be if you've ever been trying to get to sleep at night and you're, you're worrying about something. So it doesn't have to be a really big worry even. It could just be that you're laying in bed, you're a bit restless, and you're just, you know, maybe I've experienced this myself, just thinking about all the stuff you've got to do the next day. And you're laying there and thinking to yourself, oh, if I don't stop thinking about what I've got to do tomorrow, I'm going to be too tired to actually do any of it. And you just have this sort of circular, you know, your brain sort of revving over. So what you may try to do is to force yourself not to think about those things, to force yourself to stop thinking about all of the things that you don't need to think about. And brilliant, it works. What happens is you're just about to nod off to sleep and just as you're about to get into the land of nod, those thoughts pop back into memory and you start thinking about them again. That's cognitive rebound. It's increasing the likelihood that you think about something. Another good analogy I once heard from a, a clinician colleague was this, this a notion that's used often in um, a clinical context for people dealing with these sorts of intrusive negative thoughts is, is throwing a tennis ball against the wall. The harder you throw the tennis ball, the harder it comes back at you. Um, and a pretty similar thing happens with thought suppression in the context of thinking. There's evidence for both of these things in an addictions context. The cognitive rebound, some of the work by Salkovkis and Reynolds uh, is relevant here, that you can increase your thoughts about relapse and things of that kind uh, by using thought suppression to try to stop yourself from doing so. But also James Erskine and colleagues uh, back in 2010 demonstrated that behavioural rebound for smokers uh, can occur. If you get smokers to try to not think about smoking, it actually increased the number of cigarettes they smoked per day over the course of a week. So cognitive and behavioural rebound are both things that have been very, very well studied across a range of different behaviours, but have been demonstrated to be relevant to addictive behaviours. The late Dan Wegner, who really pioneered the work in this area, described this thought suppression process as the ironic process of mental control. He describes it as a dual process theory involving an operating and a monitoring process. But if I could describe this in, in very simple terms, what Wegner was arguing, the reason this is ironic, is that if you think about what it requires to suppress a thought about something, it requires you to check that you're not thinking about it. So the irony here is that actually by trying to suppress the thought, by trying to make yourself not think about the particular thing, you actually have to keep going back to check to make sure that you're not thinking about it. 
uh, Wagner and his colleagues developed something called the white bear suppression inventory, which essentially, if you want to measure the extent to which an individual uses thought suppression, and we all do it to an extent, some people far more than others, so the white bear suppression inventory is used as a measure of that um, uh, tendency to use thought suppression in daily life. The reason it's called the white bear suppression inventory is based on a sort of an apocryphal tale of uh, the author uh, the Russian author Dostoevsky, who reputedly told his younger brother that he had to stand in the corner in the dining room uh, and try not to think of a white bear. And he couldn't leave the corner of the room until he'd stopped thinking about it. And, you know, sort of the, the apocryphal towers these things go is that he stood there until he grew a beard because constantly he was sort of checking to make sure he wasn't thinking about a white bear. But, of course, every time he did that, it made him think of a white bear. Um, it's really interesting if you do experimental work looking at thought suppression. We did some work, uh, James and I, um, a while back looking at um, asking people to try and suppress thoughts about eating chocolate. And one of the ways that you do that experimentally to check whether or not people are thinking about eating chocolate or just thinking about chocolate in general is to ask people to verbalise their thoughts for two to three minutes. You say to somebody in your experiment, look, I want you to not think about chocolate, okay? I just want you to talk out loud for you know, two or three minutes. Uh, and During that time, you've got a little bell on the table, and what I'll ask you to do is to press the bell every time you have a thought about chocolate. But if you can, just please try not to. So people get going, they start talking and talking, um, and then uh, yeah, they sort of go, hello, my name's Tony, and I'm just here today to take part, and I'm not meant to be thinking about chocolate, ding, you know, get, they get really frustrated because you're sort of conscious of the fact that you're not meant to be doing something, and that makes it really difficult not to do. So <laughs> really, this is, this is related to this monitoring process, this idea that we have to keep trying to stop ourselves thinking about something, but actually what it does is it makes it hyperactive. It makes that thought in your memory hyper accessible. Um, now, what are the implications of this for our health? So thought suppression is very cognitively demanding. Actually engaging in an act of thought suppression from, from a cognitive psychological perspective, our attentional resources are limited. We can only think about one thing at a time. We can't engage in parallel processing of, of high level uh, information. Uh, automatic processing can happen, lots of them all at once in parallel, but specifically the high level mental processes are very cognitively demanding and they can be very draining. If you've tried to, if you've ever found yourself trying to suppress thoughts about some negative uh, thing, you can find yourself exhausted as a result of doing it. You'll feel physically tired as a result of doing it excessively. And there is some evidence to suggest that this can lead to a temporary suppression of immunological function. You know, this, again, this link between mind and brain is a sort of a, you know, for me, has always been very problematic. The two things go hand in hand. The, the, the mind is, 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 is a consequence of what the physical brain does, and that by burning lots of energy, it can have this physical impact on us. There's also robust evidence that, uh, to, that thought suppression can complicate pre-existing mental health disorders. So, for example, uh, people with PTSD can have more severe PTSD if they also happen to use thought suppression. Because, again, you're aggravating the thought, the thing that you're trying, the traumatic event that you're trying not to think about, by actively trying to force it out of memory. You're actually making it more accessible and therefore more likely to spontaneously intrude into consciousness. Some of this evidence also goes further and suggests that there's possibly a causal link between thought suppression and the emergence of some mental disorders. Uh, for example, this study um, uh, in Madrid in 2008 uh, during the, the 2004 terror, terror attacks found that there was a, a connection between people who were chronic thought suppressors, so score very, very highly on measures of thought suppression in terms of just how often they do it, and symptoms of PTSD, so not full-blown PTSD, but PTSD symptomatology, um, two to three weeks after the 2004 terror attacks in Madrid. The really interesting thing about this is that this was amongst people who hadn't been directly involved, so they weren't on the scene, they hadn't had uh, friends or family who were injured or hurt in that situation. There were people who lived in the area but actually hadn't had any direct personal impact other than, of course, the emotional impact of having been there. And so it's really interesting then that those people, if they were thought suppressors, trying not to think about all the things that you would naturally, of course, be kind of concerned about, you know, what if I'd have been there, what if somebody that I know or love had been there, how terrible is it, you know, worrying about all the things that could happen next. But for people who use thought suppression very regularly in daily life, that was increasing the uh, emergence of PTSD type symptoms within that period. In the context of smoking, there's been quite a bit of work. Uh, Silkovskis and Reynolds' work I've already mentioned. Um, 
Uh, showing that smokers attempting to quit report actively trying to suppress smoking related thoughts. People when they're trying to give up smoking, many people will often report that one of the strategies they'll use is to simply try to not think about smoking. And if they have thoughts about smoking, the way they'll deal with it is try to express them out of memory, to push them out of, or suppress them out of memory. Um, I've also mentioned James's work uh, showing that the suppression of smoking related thoughts was associated with increased smoking a week later. So that's the behavioral rebound. In the context of drinking, we know that the suppression of alcohol-related thoughts can increase the accessibility of these thoughts. So if you ask a person to uh, try not to think about alcohol or alcohol-related things, it actually makes it easier for them to think about those things. Um, and this is important because we know, and, and we've shown to myself and uh, Ian and other colleagues working in this area, have shown that, that the extent to which thoughts about drinking behaviours are more accessible in memory is a predictor of people consuming more alcohol over time. So is there anything you can do about it? I'm talking about thought suppression. I'm saying that it's a really problematic avoid and coping strategy. Well, one of the things that seems to be a useful alternative to thought suppression is mindfulness. Now, it's important to say that from a cognitive perspective, mindfulness is not the polar opposite to thought suppression. It's not the, it's not the opposite process. But it does seem to be, based on some of the evidence from um, particularly uh, the, these couple of uh, studies here for smoking and drinking, that in the context of using mindfulness type techniques, so... Um, uh, using mindful techniques, uh, excuse me, uh, mindfulness techniques, which are about not trying to control the thoughts, specifically not interfering with negative thoughts that you had, and allowing them to kind of pass and to dissipate using various different techniques. There's evidence that mindfulness is more efficacious in reducing negative emotion or affect, depression, and also nicotine dependence. So it seems to be a much more healthy way of dealing with it. And really, coming back to the point that I made about avoiding coping to begin with. Um, it really does suggest that actually, rather than trying to push a negative thought away, just allowing it to kind of go away is a far more effective strategy than trying to kind of interfere with it or trying to push it away. Uh, similarly, with uh, in the context of alcohol use, there have been some studies showing that there is uh, a degree of efficacy for mindfulness, showing that it also leads to a reduction in thought suppression. So when people are being mindful and using mindfulness techniques, it reduces the frequency with which they will actually report utilising thought suppression. Now, I've said a lot about thought suppression, which is, uh, as I describe, a conscious level thing. It's something that you know that you're doing. It's not something that happens unconsciously. It's not something that you would be unable to report that you've done. But what is this thing called repressive coping? Now, based on some uh, work that I'm going to come to just shortly that, that I've done with colleagues in this area, when I first heard about thought suppression, it really interested me because coming from a cognitive psychological perspective where I understand and, and I view things through this, what we describe as a dual process model, uh, whereby there is a... Uh, a distinction made between the processes that happen unconsciously and automatically and very rapidly and the higher level processes involving attentional systems, working memory, executive function and so on that happen in a very controlled way and over which we have a subjective experience and a degree of control. I was really interested when I first learned about thought suppression because it immediately struck me that well if this is happening, if this is a conscious process, is there an unconscious counterpart? Now. It, was, it intrigued me at the time that in the context of addictions research, there didn't seem to be any evidence. There was research that had happened looking at thought suppression in addiction, looking at mindfulness as an alternative uh, strategy to uh, thought suppression. But what I uncovered in the, in the psychological literature was that in other areas of health research, there has been a focus on this phenomenon of repressive coping, which as it turns out, is another form of avoiding coping. So again, again, not to bury the lead, repressive coping is not a good thing. It's not a good strategy to use. In the long term, it leads to other negative consequences. It appears not to be a good way of dealing with negative thoughts. But the really interesting thing about repressive coping is it's a much more strategic coping mechanism that doesn't appear to have the same conscious intent associated with it. So people who are repressive copers will actually not be able to tell you that they are. They will simply tell you that they don't have negative intrusive thoughts. They seem to just to not experience them. Just as a side note to this, this is not synonymous with repression, the psychodynamic concept um, or the 
concept often linked with re research and, and working in trauma, which is this idea that you can have memories that you're unable to recall because they were very traumatic. Unhelpfully in the literature, repressive coping and repression are often used interchangeably. Uh, I'll talk here about repressive coping and what I, what I mean by repressive coping is a strategy by which people push uh, intrusive negative thoughts out of mind but do it in such a way that they're unable to report to us that that's what they've done unlike people who are thought suppressors so when I first came across this work and I, I, this will become clearer just shortly when I first came across this work it struck me that this was a potential candidate for an unconscious form, form of thought suppression and there has been some really interesting findings in that regard just to explain what repressive coping then is um, People who are repressive copers are um, identified as being people who experience a low level of anxiety. So they self-report a low level of anxiety. <clears throat> they also have a very high level of defensiveness. Um, and the two measures that are used in this, the, Man the Taylor Manifest Anxiety Scale for measuring anxiety, essentially is your, your subjective experience of how anxious you feel in daily life. Defensiveness is measured using this measure called the Marlowe Crown Social De Socially Desirable Responding Scale or Social Desirability Scale. And essentially what this means is that there's a combination of people who subjectively self-report that they don't experience high levels of anxiety, but also have a tendency to not want to report things like that. So being highly defensive would mean that you wouldn't be keen on sharing those sorts of things. This classification distinguishes repressive coper from people who are truly low, low in anxiety. So people that would be low in anxiety and low in defensiveness. So I would be quite, you know, a person who's low in defensiveness would be quite happy to share the fact that they, they experience anxiety or not. But people who report low anxiety and low defensiveness um, are not the same as people low in anxiety and high in defensiveness. The interesting thing about this, because what I'm sort of insinuating here, of course, is that people who are repressive copers actually do experience anxiety, but they're just not telling us. And interestingly, that's been borne out by physiological measurement. So people who are repressive copers, despite reporting low anxiety, actually, if you look at the physiological measures that we know are very strongly and reliably linked to experiences of anxiety, they score very high. So that physiologically speaking, they seem to be in a heightened state of anxiety, but subjectively, they appear not to be. And so there's this idea that what's happening is that they are unconsciously suppressing uh, those, those feelings of anxiety. And it's not the case that they're simply lying about it. It's that their own experiences that they do not seem to think that they are. But that's important. It's important because particularly for the physiological component, long-term experience of heightened physiological anxiety, whether or not you're subjectively aware of it, can have lots of negative consequences. So repressive copers appear to be more effective in exercising mental control than thought suppressors in the sense that they don't seem to report intrusive negative thoughts. If you ask a repressive coper, do you tend to find yourself preoccupied with you know, worries and, and ruminating about things? Say, no, I don't. And they also seem to not experience any rebound from that. So if they're using thought suppression in any way, for some reason, it doesn't appear to lead to these cognitive or indeed behavioral rebound effects. However, in the longer term, being a repressive coper has been shown to be associated with increased mortality and also poor health outcomes uh, for lots of different diseases. And, and very interestingly, repressive coping, the literature in which you'll find a lot of work on repressive coping, looks at other things like chronic health conditions, not addiction. I've yet to find any research on repressive coping and addiction, but it seems to be a common measure that's used. Uh, to look at outcomes for people who have had uh, cardiovascular illness, cancer, uh, and various other chronic health conditions. There was this particular paper that intrigued me in 2002, which was a five-year study looking at um, heart attack patients and using a high-contact support intervention. Now, what that really meant, what meant was that, uh, and this wasn't a study specifically, in fact, looking at the repressive coping, although the authors measured repressive coping as one of the many measures they included, what the authors were really interested in was whether it was possible to help improve health outcomes for people who had had uh, myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, um, by having a more assertive sort of outreach intervention. So obviously if you have a heart attack or a cardiovascular incident, 
then what you need to do is ensure that you're getting your blood pressure and your medication checked and you're seeing a specialist or a GP, a healthcare professional regularly and not missing appointments. Missing appointments can be quite dangerous if you're uh, on medication for high blood pressure and then your blood pressure returns to normal but you continue taking the medication, then of course that can lead to either high or low blood pressure depending on what medication you're taking, uh, which of course can then be associated with an increased recurrence of uh, things like heart attacks. So it's important if you've had a heart attack and you're under a clinic that you're having your regular checkups. So really the very simple idea was, you know, if we contact people more regularly and keep them engaged, will that help them to not forget? Will it make sure that they you know, keep uh, remain aware of the importance and so on? And what happened in this study is pretty much that that was the case, that for most participants it seemed that having a high degree of contact was associated with more positive health outcomes five years on. Except if you were a repressive COPA. Now, the interesting thing about this study is that the fact that they found this didn't seem to be an effective intervention technique for repressive copers wasn't really studied any further because it was really a sort of a secondary finding. They didn't set out to look at the impact of uh, this on repressive copers in general. Uh, as with many studies of this kind, you measure lots of these different factors so that you can look at subgroups to make sure that the new intervention works well for everybody, not just for most people on average. But the uh, hypothesis or the inference here was that perhaps what was happening is that because repressive copers tend to live their life by not worrying about things, not having this heightened level of anxiety, at least subjectively, that by having this high level of contact from the clinic was serving as a constant reminder. It was undermining their natural coping style, which otherwise, at least in the short term, seemed to be working better for them. The other interesting thing about repressive coping is that it's very, very prevalent. Uh, Lynn Myers has done lots of work in this area and has found that uh, amongst older adults, I think in the sort of 70s uh, and over, up to 50% of people will be identified as repressive copers. And that seems to increase with age. The older we get, the more likely we are to use repressive coping. <clears throat> And the two things that we think, the two primary processes, very interestingly, that are thought to underlie the way that people repressively cope are attentional avoidance and thought suppression. So that really interested me when I came across this, that actually repressive copers are not doing something entirely distinct to what thought suppressors are doing. And in some cases, and here uh, Langens and Morth uh, identified that thought suppression is the strategy a repressive coper will use if they have uh, exposure to something that is very highly threatening. If a thought suppressor is, a, is exposed to something that's not particularly threatening, but not something they care to think about, they'll use attentional avoidance, which is quite simply thinking about something else. So rather than trying to actively push the thought out of memory, they'll just switch attention, they'll do something else, they'll distract themselves. Barnier and colleagues found that repressive copers also, as I mentioned earlier, seem to be immune to these rebound effects. So whereas thought suppressors, when using thought suppression, will eventually experience cognitive or behavioural rebound, thought suppressors, when they use thought suppression, uh, re repressive copers, sorry, when they use thought suppression, appear not to experience this rebound. And Elke Geertz and her colleagues have argued that this is evidence of repressive copers actually being natural thought suppressors. Part of the reason that they think they're able to thought suppress and to do it more effectively is that repressive copers also seem to have stronger and more effective executive function and working memory capacity. So there's this idea that essentially they're using the strategy of thought suppression, but the reason they're able to do it and to maintain suppressed thoughts and you know to keep the thought suppressed over a longer period of time and not to have it rebound is that actually they simply have more capacity, executive function and working memory are core components of the brain that allow us to engage in that sort of effortful mental control. So there's this really interesting overlap that's emerged between the two. Which led to myself and uh, James Erskine, Ian Aubrey and other colleagues to think about whether or not there was a natural overlap between these two areas of avoiding coping, um, that actually there may be a common mechanism, and particularly this, this notion that repressive coping seems to increase with age, whether or not that actually thought suppressors and repressive copers may not necessarily be as, as distinct as we may have thought. Um, and so we've argued for a common underlying pathway linking thought suppression and repressive coping. Um, and they may not necessarily have distinct mechanisms, there may just be certain things that distinguish the groups. The model here that we outlined essentially 
puts in the middle of it basically the importance of threat evaluation. So we've identified already through um, the work of uh, the work we just mentioned uh, that whether or not a person is experiencing a high or low degree of threat determines for repressive copers whether they choose the response of attentional avoidance or thought suppression. Thought suppressors, on the other hand, regardless of whether or not the intrusive thought is very high or low in terms of its level of threat, seem to just use thought suppression anyway. This leads to some really interesting predictions that you could make about why there are these differences in response selection. Um, it could be linked to this idea uh, from Elke Gerrert's work and her colleagues that part of the problem for a person who's a thought suppressor is that they may have a lower degree of executive function and working memory capacity. So they're unable to uh, effectively use thought suppression or to maybe make this distinction. But there may, may all be something, something else going on a bit further upstream, which is the degree to which uh, the, 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 somebody's uh, exposure to risk um, determines. So for example, if you're a thought suppressor, do you simply not evaluate anything as being low in terms of threat? Is there a, uh, a higher threshold for you in terms of, uh, or a lower threshold for you in terms of threat evaluation? So it could be that there's a distinction between repressive copers and thought suppressors, meaning that thought suppressors have a lower threshold for what they consider threatening than repressive copers do, which means that actually thought suppressors in principle could use attentional avoidance. It's just that they never do because they evaluate everything as being more highly threatening. Um, there's also the implication potentially um, that the reason that repressive coping seems in terms of the population prevalence seems to be increasing with time is actually because it's representing the automatization of thought suppression that people who are thought suppressors earlier in life when they do it more and more and more for some of those people they may actually turn it into an automatized process and therefore do it unconsciously or non-consciously and that may develop into uh, a form of repressive coping. Now the honest answer is to these sorts of questions is we don't know. This is something that we're currently still working on. We've got some research going on uh, with some other colleagues at the moment to try to understand it. There are, there are no studies to date that we've come across that have measured both thought suppression and repressive coping together. So that's some of the work that we're currently in the process of doing. Um, but what we were trying to bring together in this model was a sort of a more, a more heuristic, as we describe it, a sort of a rule of thumb type understanding of how these two processes might be connected. And particularly because repressive coping seems to have such a, a, an important connection with other sorts of health behaviours and chronic health conditions, and the fact that it's never been studied in the context of addictive behaviour, and yet thought suppression has and seems to have uh, some significant impact on outcomes uh, for people with addiction, uh, this is a, an interesting future area for research uh, with regards to mental control. So we've covered quite a lot of content there. Uh, so what have we learned? Well, we began by looking at incentive sensitization theory um, as a really important theory that helps us to understand this paradox of the loss of control and specifically why it is that people may be in a situation where they say they don't want to do something but nonetheless feel this overpowering urge to have to do it. And so Robinson and Berridge in their work on incentive sensitization theory really took us slightly further or quite a bit further than we did from the work around learning theory and operant conditioning to try and provide a neurobiological basis for why it is that this distinction, why there can be this disconnect between what you enjoy doing subjectively and what you feel like you have to do um, in terms of those compulsive urges, that drug liking, drug wanting distinction. Because the urge is something that emerges from Robinson and Berridge's work so significantly um, and that sense of urge and craving and having to do something seems so central, we then went on to look at the work of Tiffany and Franken where they try to help us to understand more about how it is that these urges can develop. You know, Do you always, when you're craving, have to have a subjective experience? According to Tiffany, no you don't. That A lot of our cravings, so to speak, in inverted commas, may actually happen non-consciously. They may be the simple pursuit of automatically activated goals and that the subjective experience of craving only happens when we're unable to fulfill that goal that we have to engage our brain so to speak and think about how to find another way around getting some alcohol or cigarettes or heroin or whatever it may be
We then looked at uh, Franken's neuropsychopharmacological model, but as complicated as though that sounds, is actually a really neat way of trying to bring together a lot of these important concepts around uh, attentional bias and what that means for the pursuit of drugs and how it links to craving and how that all fundamentally all links in with this idea of incentive salience, that we are tagging cues, tagging information in our environment, and our brain is recording that it's associated with positive outcomes uh, that we desire. Um, and then finally, we went on to look at a very specific area of work around uh, mental um, control and the extent to which we try to exert mental control, particularly over negative, intrusive thoughts that we might have. And we looked at two different ways that people can do that, using thought suppression as a conscious, uh, subjectively self-reportable uh, technique and repressive coping that seems to happen non-consciously and that increases with age. And the important thing about those two things that we, we, we brought together at the end is that they may have some significant overlaps, except that in the context of addiction research, we know that thought suppression is something that happens. We know that if people can be encouraged not to do it, it can have positive outcomes in terms of treatment. But we also know that repressive coping happens amongst a lot of people in the population, but we don't actually know how relevant it is to addiction recovery. And so by bringing those two areas of work together, we hope in the future to be able to understand more about that.